Welcome to our global partners. Before we get started on today's VM Live, like always, I have the pleasure of doing some kick starts. So as a reminder, like all VM Lives, today's VM Live is being recorded and playbacks are going to be available to you. About 24 to 48 hours after we air live, log into Partner Connect. On the far right side of Partner Connect, you're going to see our VM Live page. That's going to help you get to our on-demand sessions and our live upcoming calendar. And because we are live, we want you here, our partners live with us, helping us learn, helping you learn, market, sell, and deliver on VMware's product solutions and tools. Being live also gets you questions answered in real time by our great subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. Speaking of subject matter experts, I'm going to turn today's VM Live over to my friend, Guy Bartram. And Guy, you have some special guests with you today. Thank you, Teresa. Yes, we do. Um, today is a slightly different um, agenda, really. We're going to be talking about Sovereign Cloud uh, and data protection explicitly in Sovereign Cloud. And as such, we're going to be talking to our ecosystem providers, um, Veeam and Cloudian. Um, so I'm delighted to have Dale from Veeam and Phil from Cloudian on, on the line today. Uh, we're going to be walking through some of our products, uh, some of the aspects of their products, and we're also going to be um, running a demo. So let's start with an introduction. And uh, my name is Guy Bartram. I'm director of product marketing for our cloud providers. Um, I run the Sovereign Cloud program and a few of our of our core products like BCD. Um, and uh, Dale, why don't you go first? Why don't you just introduce yourself? Hi, this is uh, Dale. So I do is I run the um, VMware Alliance for uh, VM Software. Thanks, Dale. And Phil? Hi, everyone. I'm Phil Bendick, a solutions architect, part of the Strategic Alliances team, focusing on delivering solutions around our hybrid and multi-cloud architectures. Thanks, Phil. And actually, we do have one other person. Sorry, Andy, I missed you out. <laughs> Andy, can you introduce yourself? Hey, no worries. Hey, everybody. I'm Andy Sterniolo, a senior solutions architect here at Veeam working in product management. Thanks, Andy. So complete full house today. Uh, what's the agenda for today? Um, I'm going to be talking for about 15 minutes and we're going to cover some of the market drivers and a bit of an overview of Sovereign Cloud. Then we're going to have um, Veeam talk about data protection explicitly in Sovereign Cloud. And then Cloudian are uh, going to talk about their services for object storage. Um, and then Phil is going to run a demo and Andy's going to contribute to that demo. So we're going to be seeing Cloud Director and it's all its glory. Um, we're going to be seeing Cloudian delivering object storage via the object storage extension into that Cloud Director environment. And we're going to be seeing Veeam providing data protection and um, um, uh, what it was what I'm looking for, uh, backup immutability on the object, uh, object storage platform. So pretty cool demo for you guys in store today. Um, and just to reiterate that, you know, Veeam and Cloudian um, are two of our ecosystem partners. Um, we've integrations very tightly integrated with Cloud Director and have, you know, both alignment to our sovereign cloud pillars and sovereign cloud capabilities. Uh, and that's why, you know, we have this uh, solution around data protection that we wish to talk about today. So let's dive into some of the market drivers. So let's look at the rising global data protection laws and standards. Um, in the last few years, we've seen a dramatic rise in the number of data protection laws and standards. Um, 132 countries, that's 57% of the world, now have data privacy laws. And we're seeing a, approximately a 10% increase, uh, annual increase, on the amount of countries that are um, introducing data privacy laws. And I guess the, probably the main one that everyone has heard of in the European Union, uh, we have the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, this is where we um, unanimously approved uh, GDPR data protection regulations. Um, and this really applies for uh, personal data and protecting personal data for any company doing business with an EU entity. Uh, just for example, in other locations, we have Brazil, um, and they have a new Data Privacy Act, uh, which restricts the collection, processing, and transfer of personal data explicitly to the US. In Canada, we have Digital Privacy Act, uh, which addresses new technologies such as cloud and imposes stronger accountability and greater sanctions. 
uh, in the United States, the California Consumer Act uh, is probably the most comprehensive customer privacy law in the United States today. And in Australia, uh, the Privacy Act and in China, um, the Personal Information Protection Law, both deliver reforms following really the inspiration from the EU's GDPR. And data privacy isn't getting easier. Um, additionally, as this graph shows, there's been a steady increase in data breaches involving different attack vectors. Data breaches have gotten more severe since first recorded in 2005. And the statistics show that hackers are highly motivated by money to acquire data. And that personal information is a high value um, type of data to compromise. It's also apparent that companies are still not prepared for the breaches, even though they, these are now commonplace. The attacks are getting smarter, now tar targeting small subsets of data. Um, so things that you may not feel that are important, i.e. the first line of your address, um, and then using those da that data in um, AI and ML to compile that data and create joins of that data so larger data sets of personal information can be created. So really building out um, more uh, complete profiles of the, um, of the person they're trying to attack um, and doing that in very, very clever ways and using new technologies to do that. And data privacy is really driving data, data gravity. Um, data privacy of all data includes personal data, but also all classifications. And all of this is subject to data gravity. Data gravity is where data grows and stays put while apps move um, to where the data resides to ensure performance. Data sovereignty, on the other hand, is where data is subject to uh, data privacy laws and governance structures within the nation where the data is collected. And the sovereign cloud market is growing. Um, it's a very large opportunity considering the market trends I've spoken about, especially in EMEA, where there are complex legislations and local laws as well as EU directives. Um, to sum up the opportunity for our cloud providers, statistics tell us by 2027, 25% of the IaaS in EMEA will be tied to sovereign requirements and that the IaaS market is expected to grow four times the size until 2027. That creates a roughly a, um, 8 billion market opportunity. The opportunity exists mostly in public sector, um, operations of vital importance and various regulated sectors such as health, finance um, and aeronautics or manufacturing. VMware cloud providers are really well positioned to capture this market, already having a strong business uh, within the local markets, having relationships and presence within a nation, but also innovation within this sector. with regulations like um, GAIA-X for digital sovereignty on a European scale. And combined with the invalidation of the EU-US EU privacy shield, um, this really enables European cloud providers to differ their offerings versus hyperscale um, commercial cloud. So some of the drivers for a sovereign cloud, really customers are facing a dilemma. The need for digital transformation is very much there and this is gonna scale out, but critically they gotta keep control while doing that. Some of the pressures noted here security from geopolitical threats. We're all aware of what's going on in the world uh, and the different geopolitical views are really causing a lot of um, headaches for different countries around the world. Cybersecurity and the risk to business, uh, understanding your data and being able to provide classification rules around your data. Regulatory com compliance can be seen as a hindrance to growth. And we've got to remember that data is going to continually grow at 23% year on year. So the, the situation is not going to get better. It's going to evolve and scale is going to compound the problem. So data sovereignty is all about choice and control. Um, it cannot hinder business. It must be um, flexible to provide choice and control. Control of the management of all data must be aligned with the criticality of data such as customer data, 
metadata, account data, data classification must be in place and lifecycle management. You need to prevent um, access from foreign bodies and foreign authorities from, from accessing that data. Um, and you need to address both legacy and next generation new environments. Customers need to be able to leverage the agility and affordability of cloud. Uh, and that's clear across all cloud types, private, public, hybrid, multi-cloud and commercial hyperscale cloud. They've got to keep control of their digital assets. Um, they've got to ensure autonomy to with their digital suppliers to guarantee a continuality of digital services. And we've all seen supply, supply chain disruption, so we know exactly what that's like. Customers also need to ensure compliance with new and changing privacy laws. As we saw, they're changing at 10% per year, uh, and this is going to cover data location, jurisdictional control, cross-border data flow, um, and things like litigation as well. And data sovereignty must support digital economy and deliver that choice and control. This is achieved by looking at the strategic imperatives, so what policies and regulations, and then, then looking at um, key principles aligned with your sectors or business or verticals, and must be compliant with the rules, reference architectures and certifications for specific countries or sectors. Lastly, customers need to be enabled to drive their business within this framework of digital and data sovereignty. This is where sovereign clouds and trusted clouds play their part. And whilst sovereign cloud expects to see exponential growth, as we can see here, there is a high risk from competition. Namely, while the EU grows and traditional sectors are just starting to move to cloud, which is the case today, there's a, still an awful lot of on-prem environments. Much of that move could go to US-based hyperscale clouds. And if unchecked, it will gather exponential growth and will impact in Europe, the EU public cloud market, with an estimated 50% of potential growth going unrealized uh, in sovereign clouds. So what is sovereign versus a trusted cloud? This slide details at a high level scale across trust zones. A customer's IT security can be organized into different zones as reflected in the architecture and seen in security domains. At the furthest left, the offering on this scale, the more trustworthy sovereign the offering is. The further you go to the left, the more trusted the system is and more risk mitigation is required. However, there are some hard stops such as sovereign, um, sovereign data requiring a, um, a, a zone that is in country. Uh, placement should be considered on the least trusted sovereign dimension of the service. So for example, a cloud provider who has dedicated cloud offering uh, deployment in country where the customer resides, let's say in Norway, uh, the compute network storage and management of the, um, of the solution are in country, so everything's good so far, but the, the business out of hours is managed by a support team from a partner in the UK. This means that the access and control now based on foreign dependencies, and this disqualifies the service, at least in one dimension, um, because it has a foreign dependency. So it would move that uh, customer into the third domain as minimum. If a partner decides to build a support team in Norway or Switzerland where uh, in the customer's base, then we can shift that zone to, le uh, to left one into zone two because both Norway and, Swi and Switzerland are in the e EEA. So firstly, we need to uh, assess data, classica data classifications uh, against the proposed services and understand where the data can reside um, based on the um, necessary locations and available mitigations. And this is an opportunity for cloud partners to overlay their solutions. And by this, I mean, in many cases, specific data classification can be placed on um, a platform, a particular platform or security domain, if certain controls are in place, like confidential um, data can reside on shared sovereign cloud infrastructure if the, uh, the data itself is encrypted. 
So in light of a trusted zone scale, VMware delivers unique capabilities, embracing sovereign cloud imperatives in each zone. And VMware recognizes sovereign cloud providers are delivering on a high level, the requirements of data privacy and data security, uh, such as supremacy of local jurisdiction and local management as examples. A trusted public cloud are mainly delivered by a partnership between a cloud provider and an MSP. So for example, uh, Thales and Google. VMware ensures our sovereign cloud partners self-attest to the sovereign cloud imperatives of data residency, data security, uh, data privacy, and data innovation without lock-in and data mobility, um, and also comply, comply with the regulations. And it all starts from a sovereign cloud stack. The base requirement of a sovereign cloud provider in VMware is VMware Cloud Foundation or the deployment of a VMware validated solution which you may know as a VMware validated design, they're soon going to be renamed to validated solutions. The offering out of the box delivers that SDDC security, compliance uh, and integrity can be further enhanced with our ecosystem vendors that complement our sovereign cloud uh, capabilities. Um, in regards to the additional sovereign cloud key principles of innovation, Tanzu offers container as a service, Kubernetes operations with TKGS and TKGM, and also application marketplace functions like App Launchpad. The Tanzu platform delivers um, a developer platform on Kubernetes, and Tanzu data services delivers high performance caching on Gemfire, resilient messaging and streaming with RabbitMQ, open source RDBMS with Tanzu SQL, and data analytics with Greenplum. So a variety of capability is delivered out of the box. A variety of capability underpinning Sovereign Cloud is also delivered by our ecosystem partners. So to sum up the key differentiators for a, a, a VMware Sovereign Cloud partner, Sovereign Cloud partners have no exposure to foreign jurisdictional controls like the US Cloud Act. They are um, the ongoing uh, they're able to address the ongoing um, requirements to respond to sovereign RFP requirements, such as um, things around governance in ESG, but also critically things around environment and social. Um, a lot of our sovereign cloud partners do a lot of uh, business with government entities. A lot of government entities are mandating uh, a certain amount of sustainability and a certain amount of social values within their um, RF, uh, RFPs. And that means that if you're not providing um, any underlying ESG uh, benefit in your cloud, then you will be losing out a certain percentage of the bid weight. So in the UK, I think it's 10% uh, of the bid is um, dedicated to what we call social values in the UK. So really addressing the sustainability and social um, national drive. Sovereign Cloud Partners are built on uh, a trusted and supported technology, as I just discussed, the, the main Sovereign Cloud stack, and they are multi-cloud ready with solutions that align and cover all of the Sovereign Cloud principles we've spoken of today. Okay, um, that's it from me. I'm going to now pass over to Dale. And Dale, I know you're on the phone. So when you want me to forward a slide, just let me know. Thank you very much, uh, Guy. So yeah, let's start with the market trends and the real, real world uh, outages. And I like to start with this uh, slide because every year, Bean does a very comprehensive data protection uh, study. And what I thought was really interesting here is if you take a look at this, it, it shows a lot of the market trends on these outages, but you kind of notice that the cyber event is up at the top of the list as being the most impactful to businesses um, You know, last year when the survey was uh, done. Now, there's a lot of different outages. I mean, you can have an internal NISCU, you can have some due to hardware OS issues, um, some occur accidentally, some occur maliciously. 
But I think what's really key here is the cyber events are starting to become more uh, prevalent. And um, I think a lot of us are starting to see these ransomware attacks um, really coming around and affecting our lives in every way. So that's what we wanted to partner up very closely with VMware and Clomian to provide some solutions on, uh, on that. Let's take a look at some of the problems, um, you know, that I think that we need to be prepared, uh, you know, about. And the first thing is, is really understanding what happens to your uh, business. And if you think about it, if you don't have the right business continuity plan in place, I don't care if it's a um, recovery from some sort of disaster, could be environmental, or if it's from a, uh, a cyber attack, you got to have a plan and such in place. The other thing is, um, what about some of the fines if something goes wrong with respect to some geo-specific uh, compliance rules? Or even worse, think about what would happen if you did have a ransomware attack and some bad actors kind of got a hold of your data and encrypted it, what do you do? So the idea is to essentially take the value proposition of what Guy has gone over where you have that extreme confidence in the data sovereignty and not leaving that area. And layering that on top of what Veeam could provide along with Clavian to make sure that your data is protected. You have immutable uh, copies uh, of this with the benefit that your risk should be a lot lowered for whether it's you know, non-compliance or paying fines or you know, even worse, having to pay a, uh, a ransomware. So if you look over to the right, there are some of the trends that I think we're seeing. So this is becoming you know, for real and we gotta be ready to address it. So let's move on to why is ransomware so effective? This is actually frightening in the sense that there's ransomware being created every single day. I mean, I've seen reports saying there can be up to a million new pieces of ransomware created every day. And it's hard to kind of keep up with everything that's, uh, that's going on. And if you also think about it from a network perspective, networks are very, very complex. So that means that you can have the ability to have vulnerabilities, maybe even unintentionally, being built into the, uh, the fabric. Now, there's a lot of little examples here. Let me just pick about two or uh, three. Um, untested backups. Um, a lot of people just don't follow best practices when they're uh, backing up. And then all of a sudden they find out they can't get a hold of their data in the event of a, uh, a disaster. And even if you are able to pay a ransom, there's no guarantee that someone is going to still cooperate uh, with you. Um, poor password policy. I think all of us go through that, uh, you know, that training at least once a year on change your passwords, make them very uh, unique and such. Um, it's not followed as much as it probably should be. And a lot of people aren't using two-factor authentication. So again, it allows the ability to get into something to do something malicious. And then maybe one last point is just lack of segmentation because you know, flat networks are, are a lot easier to manage but it also allows that malware to spread easily if it gets in. So I think the key message that I wanna kind of point out to you is this is not if ransomware happens, but it's when ransomware uh, happens. So now let's move to the next chart and talk a little bit about what I think customers are looking for. So look, no matter how good you are in trying to block ransomware out, and there's a lot of things that can be done to do some advanced threat detection and remediation. The point is it's safe to assume that your defenses will eventually be breached. And in that case, you know, I would say the best offense is a good uh, defense against ransomware. And this is where Veeam really shines because we're gonna ensure that your data is safe and more importantly, be able to rapidly make it available when needed. So our Veeam products will essentially will protect your data with mutable storage against ransomware threats. They'll detect and monitor your data to ensure that if you have to restore, you can do this uh, you know, very quickly and not really go in and reintroduce any of the uh, threats. So if you follow some of the best practices like leverage multiple copies, have an offsite uh, backup and even an offsite uh, uh, DR site, 
and immutability. Those things could really help you be prepared um, as, a, as a, a defense so that if something does happen, you're ready for it. Move on to the next one. And this just kind of shows what our uh, products are. Now, those that know Veeam Backup and Replication, that's really our flagship product. It, it does the backup, um, it, it does the replication. And in some cases, if you really, really needed to have um, really good RPO times, like, you know, around five seconds and such, it actually has uh, a continuous data protection um, ability in there to give you those low RPO and eventually low RTO uh, time. The Veeam One uh, monitoring, it really um, supplements and complements very nicely what, what Be Realize does and provides some uh, analytics by looking at you know, your overall uh, backup environment. And then Veeam Disaster Recovery Orchestrator, that'll really handle a lot of your automated DR planning and testing. So what's nice is you have this um, one solution that encompasses all of these particular functions and features to really help you, um, you know, attack these type of, uh, you know, disaster or ransomware issues. So I'm going to move on to the next page here, and this just at a high level, I think, kind of tells what I call an end-to-end -end, um, intrinsic security and ransomware uh, solution. Basically, what it does is you can think about all the things that VMware is going to provide in a sovereign cloud. They're essentially going to go in and, you know, guarantee that data uh, sovereignty so that you know that that data is not leaking out of uh, that area and they do that by protecting the infrastructure and also ensuring that the right firewalls and gateways are there as well as other good things that NSX uh, uh, does to really go in and protect that network. And then what Veeam and Cloudian do is they really go in and look at how could we do the protection of that sovereign data and make sure that there are, for example, immutable backups, the ability to test and plan and make sure that you've practiced enough so that if you do have an issue, you can quickly go back and uh, recover and get yourself back into uh, production. So probably best shown on the next page with this uh, very simple diagram that we, uh, that we have here. So over on the left, you can kind of see the uh, certified uh, sovereign cloud, um, you know, CSP. And as Guy had mentioned before, we could leverage uh, the VMware Cloud Foundation stack and also VMware's Cloud uh, Director uh, uh, stack. And um, on the right-hand side, you see what Veeam is bringing to the table in terms of our scale-out backup repository, which is really nothing more than a two-tier um, file backup uh, system so that you can have a performance tier where you may want to have data that's there for two or three uh, weeks before you decide that you want to move it to more of a longer term uh, storage. And in that case, you can go in and put that over into a uh, uh, you know capacity uh, tier. You also notice on the left that um, there's some other options from the VMware standpoint. So for example, if you had to go out and interface with some of the overall uh, public clouds, for all of the right, um, you know, networking controls and security policies. The nice thing is, is that the Veeam solution is actually the same on any of these particular VMware solutions. And if I could just go through the last page and just show you a, a little bit more details, uh, you know, of that. Um, essentially, what we do is we move the VM data by just basically taking a snapshot, and then a proxy service will then take those backups, and then move that data into a hardened Linux repository, which can be made uh, immutable. Now, this hardened Linux repository is important because it really allows you to leverage, I'll call it, generic compute and, uh, and, and storage. So it doesn't mean you have to go in and configure your own storage or your or appliances. The solution being hardware agnostic just allows you to really work on any type of uh, uh, platform. And the other thing is you can mark that uh, hardened repository uh, immutable by just going into the GUI and checking the box. And now you've locked that in as uh, immutable. And then 
As I said before, you may not want to keep all the data for extended periods of time in a performance tier. You can move that data into a lower cost uh, object storage that would be S3 compliant. So if you look at what uh, Cloudian uh, Hyperstore brings to the uh, table, you can go in, set that immutability flag. They have object lock capability where you can actually determine from a time standpoint how long you want to be able to uh, keep that. I'll also note that coming in our version 12, we'll be able to write directly into uh, the object uh, store. So bottom line is data is just so important to any business and, and having immutable copies that really ensures that there's that untouched version of that data. And should you undergo some sort of a ransomware attack, you can kind of go off in a separate uh, environment and look at, first of all, removing the malware or the uh, uh, the viruses, trying to find out from maybe multiple restore points where you believe you have the best set of uh, data before the attack happens, because a lot of times these attacks may be there and they may be uh, dormant before they start to activate. Essentially, clean it up, test it, make sure that it's up and running, and then put that back into production. So to kind of summarize this slide, I think what VMware is bringing into the table is the protection from a data sovereignty uh, uh, standpoint, as well as protecting that network and infrastructure, guarantee that sovereignty and try to prevent as many bad things from coming in. And the combination of what Veeam and Claudian will do will essentially bring that, if there is something bad that happens, that ability to Go take care of it, remedy the problem, put everything back together again, and get your data so that you don't lose a lot of time in your production uh, you know, environment. So with that guy, we'll turn it over to uh, our Claudian partner. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Dale. I just want to kind of just reiterate one thing that like the immutability, why is that important? And you know, Phil's going to show you, um, you know, how that all works in the object storage realm, but you know, the first thing uh, attackers do is try and take out your defenses and, you know, they want to go after your backup so you can't recover it and negate the effects of their malware. So having immutability basically means that data cannot be changed. Um, and that's a, a really important aspect to remember when you're looking at this, this entire environment. All right, Phil, do you want me to drive the slides for you or do you want to drive them yourself? No, that's fine. Uh, you All can right. drive them yourself. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. So welcome, guys. For those that don't know who Cloudian is, uh, Cloudian is the most widely deployed independent provider of software-defined object storage. We provide a native S3 API, and we bring limitless capability, flexibility, and management efficiency of public cloud storage into your data center while providing a ransomware protection and reducing your total cost of ownership. Now, as you see here, we, we, we operate in a geo-distributive manner, so you can essentially have data centers across all over the world, geographically, or in its own specific territory. Now, Cloudian is a proven enterprise. It's a platform that has been a recipient of three-time customer through Gartner Insights uh, over the last three years. And for those who are not familiar with Gartner Insights, Gartner Insights is a uh, methodology where architects and technologies create these different types of vendors. So we're in a very uh, great position here while providing object storage to managed service providers so they can provide a consumption model, a margin and a revenue type model. So your customers and your tenants can all belong to one ecosystem model, giving them uh, object storage for consumption. And one thing I would like to emphasize is our great relationship with VMware and Beam, specifically in the context of VMware, so we started uh, a few years ago with VMware and we're essentially the first object storage extension to be integrated in the product called VMware Cloud Director. And this, direct, and this VMware Cloud Director platform allows customers to leverage uh, object storage at a tenancy type of level and to provide sovereign cloud. So if we can go to the next slide. So one thing I like to emphasize about clouding is that we are built for managed service providers. Managed service providers is the key of our realm. And as you see some of our top customers on the right-hand side is how we essentially have uh, these managed service providers provide uh, storage to their, to their customers, right? And we are trusted. It's very, it's very important to know that we're in all these types of verticals, right? Service providers, uh, media entertainment, 
finance, public sector, educational, and all these customers trust Cloudian to provide multi-tenancy, quality of service and building, and ensuring that our customers can, can essentially provide all these types of services, right? So if we go to the next slide, I'd like to define a bit of these services. Um, so essentially, um, when we're doing data protection at the sovereign cloud level, right, we need to be able to provide all these types of services, right? Um, essentially, a storage as a service, backup as a service, archive as a service, compliance as a service, big data as a service. And one of the favorite ones to speak about is disaster recovery as a service, which is one of the things Beam was emphasizing is ransomware. It's one of the top things, top 10 federal crimes, right, in the United States. So for us to leverage the object storage extension and provide the uh, object lock extension as well into our API allows, allows customers and managed service providers to take advantage of these uh, high level technologies, right? And integrate this by providing a single S3 API. So VMware, VMware provides the architecture designs and acts as a blueprint for service providers by building and operating cloud infrastructures that can meet sovereignty needs while allowing for a wide range of cloud service offerings. Now, cloud and object storage uh, is a management integrated with VMware Cloud Director as I depicted uh, in the previous slide, but we offer a durable and scalable feature rich storage that lets service providers deploy and manage S3 compatible storage within a service environment. Now, I'd like to also uh, emphasize a bit of the features, right? Um, is S3 API is very important. So we like to provide these type of ecosystems so customers can provide this secure type of environment and adhere to these uh, privacy laws that exist in different territories to provide a sovereign cloud. And so we're in a great position, as you see here in this illustration, is that we've partnered up with Veeam, we've par partnered up with VMware to provide an entire workflow so customers can feel secure and provide all the services for the, to meet your data sovereignty needs. And one thing that I like to also emphasize is not only am I talking about you know, data sovereignty cloud, we've also prepared a demo where we can actually showcase what the, a real architecture and definition of these diagrams actually looks like in real life. Um, and that's really it that I, you know, I would like to emphasize more on, on the demo so you guys can kind of uh, see the architecture at play. Okay, demo time then. I will stop my share. Absolutely, thank you so much, Guy. Let me uh, prepare the the environment. Uh, give me a second here. All right. Let's see. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yep, no problem. Perfect, perfect. So I'd like to kind of give a high level overview of what our integration with object storage extension really means and what it defines. So as I illustrated earlier, Cloudian is an object storage clustered system and it's heavily integrated into VMware Cloud Director. So for those managed service providers, what this really looks like, right, is we embed HyperStore at the provider level. And what that looks like is essentially grabbing the cluster integrating it with, with VMware Cloud Director and creating this connection. So you see all these API driven type endpoints are all integrated with VMware Cloud Director. So once you load up a tenant into your VMware Cloud Director, they're all separated by what we call a storage tenant ID. And these tenant ID is how we can do billing, metering and charge your tenants for their services, what they consume on a, on a monthly basis, right? So the, the advantage of, of including all this, it's multi-tenancy based and every single tenant has no idea of their tenancy. So, you know, MSP one will know about MSP two and so forth, right? So you, this integration once you, for example, you go into one of these tenants, um, once they're loaded into the object storage system, it automatically maps all that stuff into the object storage uh, cluster. So once, once the tenant is fully loaded, um, that, that they would essentially uh, are already provisioned object storage and they can use it at will. So I'm gonna actually log in as what a tenant will look like. So let's go into, I'm gonna actually use MSP2 today for this demonstration. So I'm gonna actually go into the uh, tenant view and we're gonna actually log in here as MSP2 an MSP2 admin, which is the 
organization administrator for this tenant group. So when you log in here, for those who are familiar with VMware Cloud Director, one of my favorite products, to be honest with you guys, but as you see here, these are virtual data centers and these virtual data centers um, come into play with the object storage extension because you can have V apps, you can have Kubernetes and you can have catalogs and libraries and so forth. So when we go into the object storage extension and what that really defines is here is a tenant and we have provisioned um, you know, object storage for them to use for their services, right? So when you, when you log in, you can actually go into the buckets and essentially see what a, what a bucket view looks like. And one thing I'd like to emphasize as a tenant is this metadata. And in the VMware context, what we see here is this metadata called you know, V apps or you have catalogs. It starts to actually associate the bucket level with whatever category you're invoking or orchestrating in your VMware or VCD context. So to take a step back, if we look, uh, for example, V apps, I have a V app here and we have an OVA and that OVA pertains to the v, to the V app, right? So that actually is stored into a bucket. And the, the beauty of all this is all automated into the object storage extension. So here's a catalog. And if you had a catalog, you can upload your ISOs. For example, here, I have some, some, I have a Ubuntu ISO. It's also part of my catalog and I can offer it to my VDCs and can pull and extract this data. Now, one thing that's very important as Veeam was mentioning, I was mentioning was uh, ransomware. And I like to emphasize on this bucket called MSP2L and I named it MSP2L for object lock. And if I go into this bucket, we have actually enabled and functionality called object lock. And object lock is actually fully integrated into the object storage extension. So when you're looking at this definition of properties, um, you essentially can see every single metadata tag or parameter that has been invoked for this bucket. And one thing I like to also emphasize is all done from the single pane of glass. You do not need to leave uh, VCD to invoke any of these actions. You have all these permissions. So if you wanted to do ACLs for, your, for the tenants within that group, you can also leverage that as well. You can also add policies and some customers leverage what we call lifecycle policies. For those that are familiar with AWS's lifecycle policies, the same type cloud platform topologies that you can invoke in, in these public hyperscalers are also included in the object storage extension, right? So if you wanted to actually make a new rule or expire as these objects, you could do so at will. So that really at a high level includes what the object storage extension uh, depicts and what it can illustrate for uh, managed service providers providing sovereign cloud and adhering to these, to these laws and regulations. Um, it also is a very uh, intricate methodology to also include Veeam into this play, right? It's all one giant workflow. So this same bucket that I have also illustrated to the audience, uh, MSP2L, is the same bucket that we're also protecting these VDCs. And as you see here on the right-hand side, uh, this is called MSP2 SOBAR or Scale Out Object Backup Repository in the Veeam context. And for those that are really familiar with Veeam, to create a SOBAR, you need a block level device to create a performance tier. And you also need a capacity tier, which is the object lock, uh, excuse me, a bucket to provide object lock if you wanted to uh, create immutability. So the, what I'd like to showcase here is that the same bucket that was provisioned for your tenant, they also have access to see every single Veeam archive that's going into their, their ecosystem, right, in their workflow. So we've actually set up a, a bucket with immutability with object lock. And one thing I like to showcase here is that we have set the mutability for 30 days. Now, one thing to take in fact here is that the mutability is actually uh, manipulated by Veeam. Veeam ensures that they adhere to the mutability. So all you have to do on the object storage side, you set up the object lock, and then you set up the mutability retention policies. For example, here we're using the default of 30 days. And this allows Veeam to essentially make sure that you, you cannot delete any, any uh, objects within that bucket within 30 days, right? So as you see here, I'm gonna take a step back out of here and we've created a, a SOBAR. And this so far is what pertains to this tenant. And I'm actually going to go into the Veeam Backup Enterprise Manager. 
Um, I have uh, Andy here as well, who can also talk uh, more in detail about the integration as well. Um, so I'm gonna go into the self-service portal and to also uh, illustrate here that we're using the same soul bar that has the performance tier and the bucket level uh, the, the, with object locked enabled has also been integrated into the uh, being backup manager, right? So as you see here, this MSP2 soul bar has been integrated and assigned to my tenant MSP2. So coincides, uh, and the reason why I'm showing this so you guys can see the relationship between the SOBAR and the integration so our tenants can use the SOBAR. So Andy, I'll turn it to you if you want to talk about these uh, menus and features. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Phil. Hey, everybody. My pleasure. Yeah, so one of, the, one of the great things that Phil mentioned um, about clouding and about Veeam when it comes to Cloud Director is it's all integrated in with the tenant. Um, on, on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on this side is we're, we're looking more at the administrative settings. And one of the things we wanna make sure that uh, partners can offer to their customers is flexibility when it comes to at what tier or level would you like to give your customers backup permissions? Meaning if uh, you would offer a plan or a service where customers would have full capabilities to modify and create backups, if you want them to do that, um, or if you wanted to be a little more restrictive where let's say you want the customer, customer to know what's going on in the environment. So you can give them a little bit more of a read only permission. Um, as Phil kind of hit here in the drop down, these are the typically the most settings that you can, you can cho you choose from. So if you would want to give them full access, uh, if you want them only to be able to create like a daily and a monthly job. Um, and then there are a couple of things with deny. So. Um, not giving them the, the ability to um, create like a randomized backup window. Um, and then also above that, you're, in, you're able to set quotas on the particular um, backup storage. So depending on what a customer would say pay for, uh, you could set a quota of, in this case, 100 gigabytes, which that's pretty small, right? It's just a demo, but um, you, could, you, could set quote, you could set quotas there as well. And, and here's then on some the right, of the, uh, yep, sorry, on the right hand side there, so you could kind of see what those advanced job settings are, what what's enabled for that particular org. Okay. Yep. And then so once once we get more onto the uh, the the tenant side, um, I'm sure we'll get to that, Phil. We can talk a little bit more about that as well. Absolutely. So I'm going to move into uh, back to the um, so data protection with Beam, the plugin, and uh, I'll let Andy continue uh, his demonstration here. So if Dan, Andy, if you want to go over a bit of the, over these tabs, yeah, absolutely. So keep in mind here, Phil is logged in as the MSP2 admin for this particular organization. So the the great thing about this is that the way we integrate with Cloud Director, it's a single sign-on. So they log into the into Cloud Director, and when they hit the drop down for the particular for for the Veeam plugin, right here is where you can start to really dive into and see what's going on without leaving. So the first tab we want to talk about is our dashboard. I think that's kind of pretty self-explanatory. Kind of gives you an overview of where things are at within the last 24 hours or seven days. A customer can come in here and see where they're at, maybe with their quota, um, how the throughput's going. If there's something that's maybe failed or a, a backup job that's has a problem, um, they can kind of dive into this and see it at a little high level overview. And then the next tab is our jobs tab. So if a customer has the capabilities um, with, with, with permissions you give them, here they can go and see what existing backup jobs they have. Uh, they can go in and look at those. They can create a new backup job. So it's basically like a um, a simplified version of scheduling backups. But yeah, you could you can go in here and see uh, what's happened within the last 24 hours of a particular job. You know, some of these have warnings, but that could be something simple. If you wanted to, you could go there and take a look at it. That's kind of where we're at with our jobs. But if you go back to that jobs tab, Phil, and if you wanted to say create, 
So anyone who's seen Veeam um, in a normal GUI UI, it's pretty much the same thing. It just looks a little different, but a customer can go in and specify uh, a particular V app or a virtual machine within their organization. Um, they can choose uh, when they want to run it. They can choose if they want to do guest processing. And um, they can then even specify who should be notified if the backups are successful or, or a failure. So pretty straightforward. Um, like I said, much like you've seen on typical Veeam, um, that's, that's the backup jobs tab. So the next one is the VMs tab. And like I said, keep in mind, we're still all within the tenant. We haven't left, right? So these are where you can see what virtual machines have restore points. So things that basically are being protected. So on the left-hand side, you can see those virtual machines, what VApp they're associated with, the job name. And then over on the right-hand side, you can even see that how many restore points and when the last successful one was. So if you would select one of these, you could then choose to up at the top, you can restore the virtual machine. Um, overwrite means we're just going to overwrite the virtual machine. That's if it's currently there. So let's say something happened and, and a machine blew up and you would just want to overwrite what's there. Um, that'll do that. Keep is the option where you want to restore it possibly as a different name. So you're going to have a, the original and then a new one. And then the same thing for the next one over when it comes to re restore vapp so that first one was just vm specific but this one would include all of the configuration as associated with a virtual machine with the vapp itself and then the next one is delete that's just hey you want to delete it and then you can the next one is if you wanted to pick a pr particular virtual disk from a backup so you could let's say a, a D drive or a, a data drive of a vir virtual machine needed to be restored, but not the entire machine. Um, this, this option would give you that. So here you can see Phil's kind of going in and you can be able to look at what disc mappings are there for a particular virtual machine. Might just take a minute here. Yep. So it'll give you even like the, um, the, the SCSI controller, uh, the VMDK information, if there's a storage policy associated with it. Um, and then that, that's fine. You can just cancel all this. It's no big deal. But it, then if you wanted to go through, you could even do what we mentioned earlier, uh, where Dale talked about more of that in, intrinsic security. One of the things in there that Veeam offers is called Secure Restore. And essentially what that does is, let's say that you had a ransomware attack and you have essentially remediated it from your production and you're ready to put that virtual machine back um, from, a, from a backup back up into production. Well, how do you know if the VM itself had um, some malicious files or, or, or things in it still living that if reintroduced in the environment, you'd, uh, you'd rinse repeat, right? So our secure restore option allows you to um, integrate it in with one of our um, five, I believe it's five, but essentially it could be any one you want uh, of a antivirus or a malware partner. And then you would scan that backup. And then in, in the event it found something, you're presented with a couple of options. One, you could say, hey, um, go ahead and restore it, but don't connect the network. Or two, uh, I'm just going to completely abort this and let's pick another date. So it's another layer of protection when it comes to getting the restore back into your environment. Okay. Yep. Go ahead and cancel out of that. The next one is files. So now this, this is another great value add uh, from a, a provider perspective to give to your customers. So this essentially allows a, a, cu a customer to come in and say, Hey, you know what? I need this one particular file file from last Wednesday's presentation um, Dale accidentally deleted it and we need it back. So here a customer could go pick a particular virtual machine from a specific point in time. So you can kind of see Phil's got the calendar up here. You can pick that restore point and then you can click mount. And then what that does is in the background, it actually mounts that virtual machine to the point where you can drill through and look at the, the directory structure, which we're going to see here in just a minute. 
Yeah, Andy, just in the context of like a, a sovereign uh, boundary, right? So yes, in this environment, we've got like cloudy and within the sovereign environment, right? So we're not going outside of that air gap right. environment at all. And when we're doing these restores and these these loads of uh, or mounts of disk, this is all still happening within the sovereign cloud boundary, right? So it's absolutely correct. Yep. Say, yeah. Yep. Everything everything's still within the boundaries of sovereign. Yep. Yeah. So if you picked a particular file, um, you can choose to restore it. Or you can do the same overwrite um, that you would want. And um, but one of the cool things you can also do, you can even select the download option. So if you didn't want to put it back into the virtual machine, but you wanted to download it, you can actually just download it right through your browser if if you needed the file that way, right? So if it was something that was uh, like that presentation that we accidentally deleted and we needed it back, but we didn't want to put it in the VM and then get it back out of the VM, we can just download it directly and we have it. Um, so pretty straightforward. And then this is showing an example of any type of re restore histories that we had. Um, so from a file level recovery option, it's, it's an, like I said, a great value add uh, for providers to add to their, to give to their customers. Uh, keep in mind, we still haven't left the cloud director tenant all, all in there. And then the last thing I want to talk about, because I know we're kind of running short on time here, is the items tab. So essentially, we don't have any of the, uh, database uh, for the for the demo, but I'm just going to talk about it. So keep keep in mind, it's it's sort of like the files tab, except now we're able to specify a specific database, whether that's SQL or Oracle, and then we can pick a point in time. There's like a little slider there on the right. We can scrub through and find the time of what we want, and we're able to restore a, a table or a field or anything like that that you might have. Um, to the original location or to an alternative location. So that was a feature that we we added the items tab within the new uh, version 11 plugin. And to really to get this all started and get it installed, it's just off the installation media. If you're a provider, you go into a cloud director and say, add a plugin and you're on your way. So that's just kind of a, a quick overview of what how how Veeam comes into play when providing the recovery options in that sovereign cloud. Okay, thank you, Andy. And if anybody wants to see the, the Beam plugin, just to uh, for the demo, I can actually show that real quick. I won't take too long. It's very easy to install. So as Andy mentioned, right, you download the, the, the plugin from your Beam uh, ISO your installation media, and then you essentially just upload the uh, the plugin to your uh, portal. And uh, here it is. So very integrated, as Andy mentioned. Uh, I deployed it really easily. It was uh, instantaneously uploaded. And as long as you have BBR, mean backup uh, backup, you you should be golden, right? Um, very seamless. Brilliant. So from um, you know, a cloud provider admin perspective, right? We've seen the admin steps here, load the plugin, configure the object storage, configure the Veeam connection, um, in Veeam, set up your scale out repository and link it all together. And then really you're then just deciding what offering you want to give to which tenants and what tiers of service you want to provide. And Correct. from the tenants perspective, they never have to leave cloud directors. So it's a really, really nice easy solution for them um giving them like we said right that that secure protection against ransomware and that's really great that you can actually just also do that extra step of getting the 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 vm um scanned as well or the app scanned uh, that's a, a nice extra feature i hadn't seen absolutely okay phil um is there anything else jokes we're coming up to time here I think that's it. Uh, one thing I, I do want to, with my last remarks, um, yeah, for those customers that want to grab a, the S3 endpoint as well, um, one thing I want to showcase really quickly is you can grab your tenant's S3 endpoint and plug into any S3 compliant client. So as you see here, I'm actually connecting to the MSP2 uh, tenant that we were showcasing earlier. 
and we're able to see the same buckets, right? We're manipulating. So you don't have to do everything within the OSC context. And the advantage of this is while you're using the same endpoint, right? It's the same consumption model, right? Is uh, the billing and metrics that are built in specifically with Cloudian, right? We, um, there's actually a section on that we just released with uh, VMware on billing and metrics. Uh, that's integrated into the tenant app. So I, I highly advise uh, for those on the call to uh, definitely read up on that. It's a new feature that just came out that's only with Cloudian and VMware Cloud Director. Um, I could actually post a link on that or send it to you guys. You could send that out as well. Yeah, it's a really good shout. So yeah, the latest version of Cloud Director contains all the metering information and billing information, if you want to show it, of the, the Cloudian consumption, right? And providers can um, tailor that to their needs. Okay, Jess, well, I think that's uh, fantastic. I just want to um, you know, kind of wrap up now and say, um, you know, a huge thank you um, to, let me just share this, um, huge thank you to uh, um, Phil, to Andy, to Dale, um, you know, setting up the lab, walking through the slides, um, certainly been a super exciting project to work together on. Um, I'm really, really pleased to see it in action. Uh, and it just keeps on getting better. And it really does apply to sovereign cloud environments, it applies to all clouds as well, but sovereign clouds, this is a really nice solution for you to be able to provide that scalable S3 repository. And like Phil said, right, you can offer that to developers. You know, you've got media verticals that you're working for or, or healthcare or stuff, you know, that really applies. And then protecting that data uh, and protecting that data with immutability, the simplicity of it, pulling it all together. Um, a really nice stack. So we do have um, VM Explore coming up in the US. Um, if you haven't registered for it, register for now. Um, there are a couple of Sovereign Cloud sessions that will be um, running in the US. I put them up on screen here so you can look at those up in your, in your content catalog. Um, we're going to be very much focused on getting uh, partners to talk with us at VM Explore. So we've got NextGen and Datacom in Australia, uh, sorry, New Zealand, uh, coming to talk to us um about sovereign cloud and talk to everyone who attends vm explore so if you're if you're going to vm explore you're interested in sovereign cloud these are the sessions you need and in vm explore in barcelona we'll be doing something a little bit different um planning a, a bigger event for sovereign cloud partners um thank you very much once again guys really appreciate your time today and i hope everyone found this uh really interesting on the on on the zoom session as usual, all recordings are um, posted to the VM Live uh, page on Partner Connect. Um, Teresa does this after about a week or so, so give it time for it to show up there. Um, and it just leaves me to say thank you very much. And if you want to reach out to any of the team here on you know something interesting you've seen or want to ask more questions. Uh, for Veeam, the email address is there, and for Cloudian, or if you're um, looking to ask VMware about the VCD plugins or VCD or any of the sovereign cloud information we covered today, just reach out to your, your business development manager or your aggregator, or reach out directly to me. Thank you very much. Thank you.